borders in history, the border between North and South Korea. These two nations have been in conflict for many years, since the Korean War and even before that. And so when we look at this resolution today, South Korea should significantly reduce its sanctions on North Korea. It may seem a little bit bizarre to think of these nations actually becoming more agreeable towards one another, but for many reasons, my partner and I firmly affirm this resolution today. I'm going to begin by going over some general observations for the round, some definitions and a weighing mechanism. I'm going to then present our plan and finally go into our three contentions that uh, support the affirmation of this resolution. So essentially some background for what we're looking at today is that South Korea pressed its toughest sanctions on North Korea after the a 2010 naval attack by a North Korean submarine that resulted in almost 50 deaths of uh, South Korean sailors. And so these sanctions banned all trade, investment, and exchanges with North Korea, in addition to also uh, travel-based relations. And so that's essentially why all of these sanctions are existing today. Um, and so just to then establish some definitions for the round, essentially the only thing we're going to define is to significantly reduce, um, and that's going to be defined as alleviating sanctions within the boundaries of United Na Nations sanctions. Uh, so anything, basically alleviating everything that's not directly violating sanctions that are uh, proposed by the greater power of the United Nations on North Korea. Um, and so then we are going to have a weighing mechanism of net benefits, essentially whichever side can provide the most benefit. But additionally, net benefits includes whichever side is able to solve for issues on both the affirmation and the negation side should win this debate today. So that brings me to our plan text. Um, essentially, we're going to kind of move with, with a uh, con combination, excuse me, of just the resolution and our definitions to remove current sanctions on North Korea within United Nations regulations. And so, not at this time, I'm sorry. And so according to the Council on Foreign Relations, sanctions on North Korea by South Korea include and are limited to banning North Korean ships from South Korean territorial waters, suspending inter-Korean trade, and banning most cultural exchanges. So these are the three primary things that we are going to be focusing on as to what is being alleviated um, between North and South Korea. And so this is going to occur with funding uh, by normal means, which means uh, just with passing of legislation. And the time frame is going to be as soon as is politically possible. Um, so that brings me to our first contention, which is the idea that changing sanctions on North Korea could help to help to loosen strength of ties between China and North Korea and to consequently improve relations between North Korea and South Korea. So according to the New York Times, before the 2010 embargo, South Korea invaded, uh, excuse me, rivaled China as North Korea's biggest trading partner. Now North Korea depends on China for almost all of its external trade. So by sanctioning trade with North Korea, South Korea has changed the situation of trade relations by pushing North Korea actually closer to China. Um, and so there are multiple reasons why this has a distinctly negative impact on the debate today. The North Korea-China alliance exacerbates many tensions, both in the region and in the globe, including nuclear tensions, but also issues within trade dominance. Uh, so China isn't interested in backing United Nations regulations, which is a main issue with the idea of North Korea being in close um, relations with China. Essentially, China has not shown much compliance with the United Nations, re United Nations regulations on trade or really anything else. And so we can't expect that if North Korea is in such a heavy relationship with China, that it will comply either. But additionally, we're seeing a $1.7 billion trade deficit between North Korea and China, which distinctly implies that there's some sort of um, hidden commerce deals that are occurring that... Uh, prove a certain lack of trustworthiness in the relationship between China and North Korea. And so um, when we're seeing that the bilateral trade has incre increased between North Korea and China by $6.86 billion in the last five years, according to Forbes, it is clear that this relationship has grown distinctly closer and that this has um, a negative impact. And so looking at it, when South Korea is in the interests um, of maintaining a certain sense of, um, excuse me, a certain sense of independence and able to uh, fluidly communicate with North Korea and to keep tensions at a minimum, this relationship with China and the inability to communicate with North Korea is not good. And it's largely the trade sanctions that are um, disrupting this, this communication. 
So this brings me to our second contention is that the sanctions on North Korea, to be completely honest, have been largely symbolic as far as actually being effective in the economic sense. Uh, according to Business Insider, South Korea has failed to not notify United Nations sanctions committees when it sent three trillion tons of petroleum to North Korea, and it has additionally broken uh, United Nations sanctions committee uh, sanctions um, intermittently throughout the past uh, five or so years with North Korea. And so while South Korea is imposing these sanctions on North Korea as a means of asserting a sense of dominance over the nation, these sanctions aren't necessarily effective in actually doing what they're supposed to. If South Korea is still trading with North Korea kind of um, under the United Nations uh, gaze, then it is un it's it's impractical and ineffective to assume that these sanctions are necessary and beneficial in the relationship between South Korea and North Korea. And so because the sanctions are ineffective and because they're causing distinct benefits, um, it would be more practical and ultimately more beneficial to simply remove them and work on more of a diplomatic relationship with North Korea. Yes? Wait, so if South Korea still trades with North Korea as evidenced by your symbolic advantage, why did the North Korea transition towards China? So essentially there have been a couple of South Korean deals that have kind of flown under the radar, but the majority of deals are still going, uh, still being barred, especially the trade deals in the waters of South Korea. That's the main issue. So because it can't use South Korean waters, it's depending more on China for those means. And finally, this brings me to my third contention, uh, which is the benefits of improved relations with North Korea. So according to UPI, South Korea is taking initiatives towards culturally unifying projects with North Korea. So South Korea is clearly displaying an initiative to develop a better relationship with North Korea, but the sanctions are largely prohibiting North Korea from truly being interested in the deals. And so these unifications that are uh, providing better um, relationships between the people and between the governments are dependent essentially upon the lifting of these sanctions. Additionally, we're seeing that uh, attempts from other nations to work with North Korea are failing, such as Trump's maximum pressure argument. And so if we have greater negotiability with North Korea, that can be accomplished through the lifting of these trade sanctions. It is essential that this is done in order to create greater communication and greater state stability in the world. And for these reasons, we ask for an apple. Thank you. Case positions and then the affirmative in order. Three off case positions and then the affirmative in order. The first argument is the Allied assurance disadvantage. In the status quo, North Korea, Japan has sanctions on North Korea. They've banned citizens from entering their own country. They've banned remittances, which is when the North Korean people send money back to North Korea that they made in Japan. And they've banned ships from entering Japanese ports. They also have a couple of other minor sanctions. The second thing that's happened in the status quo is that recently Japan has signaled an increasing commitment to these sanctions. The NHK publicly announced that they were going to have a two-year extension of these sanctions on March 29th, which was just a couple of days ago. Third, tensions between South Korea and Japan are extremely high after a court ruling on October 30th from South Korea essentially was pretty angry at Japan because of the fact that Japan had colonial rule over South Korea, indicating these countries are on the brink of their relationship collapsing. The links, the plan, the first argument is that uh, the plan decreases both like their commitment to uh, North Korea as a common enemy. Essentially, these countries have united over the fact that they are under the U.S. nuclear umbrella and cooperated over things like missile defense agreements so that they can fight North Korea as a common enemy. But when the plan reverses that signal from South Korea and indicates that South Korea wants to align itself with North Korea or try and thaw relations, Japan was vehemently opposed to North Korea, as evidenced by the fact that they've been securitizing against North Korea and doing things like investing in missile defense against them, means that that relationship gets, gets split apart. The second argument is that this goes over to their commitment with the United States because the United States inevitably gets angry because the United States has been particular, particularly aggressive in supporting uh, sanctions against North Korea. The internal links, the first argument, is miscalculation. The ASA point is that Japan recently turned on its fire control radars. Essentially, these are radars that make it easier for Japanese officials to launch missiles or like initiate attacks against South Korean ships, which is what they did just last month. And just last week, they locked onto um, 
a Japanese aircraft with these radars, indicating that they were trying to push South Korea out. That's because the CSEP point is that they have territorial disputes over Dokdo and Neon Court Rocks, which are two different places where Japan and South Korea right now disagree with what's happening. The second argument is that this inevitably increases Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, specifically because China increased this expansionism in October, right when we had the sub-bombing issue and when they told U.S. reconnaissance flights to turn around a bunch of times, literally days after the uh, court ruling came out saying that uh, Japan and South Korea split. Essentially, China views South Japan and South Korea and the U.S. alliance as one, and when it starts to seize holes in that alliance, it's more aggressive. The impact is war. The ASA point is that it's pretty easy for war to happen because the South China Sea and the place where the Japan uh, and South Korea have disputes are, o are over open water, which means that it's impossible for any country to control this, which means that in a case where some escalation starts, in every countries that are angry and looking to defend their own territory are going to invest resources. But since no one can win that fight in the initial phase because it's super hard to control an island that's sitting in, in the middle of water, inevitably countries invest more and more resources. The visa point is that this incentivizes China to get in the mix because they see a benefit to fighting when Japan and South Korea are fighting with each other. The CISA point is that this can involve things like medium range ballistic strikes on J Japanese bases. Yeah, question. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused. So basically by South Korea and North Korea now trading, China has an incentive to go to war with Japan? No, no, no. Or... By South Korea and North Korea now trading, Japan has felt that what was previously an ally has now abandoned it and it's sold for like their biggest share commitment, which was having North Korea as a common enemy, which now means that they're like, their relations decrease, they're angry at each other, they're more likely to pressure like other countries. But I mean, South Korea is more likely to pressure Japan, and Japan is more likely to pressure South Korea in places where they already have territorial disputes that are already like causing risk of things like miscalculation. Uh, yeah, the next disadvantage is proliferation. In the status quo, North Korea has five to ten nuclear weapons. The ASA point is that because uh, ballistic missile defense systems are generally recognized to be able to like be able to defend against these nuclear weapons for a couple of reasons. First, that these weapons can't even reach the eastern part of the United States, which means we invest our resources specifically on the western seaboard. Second, these are not advanced nuclear weapons. While they might be ICBMs, they're barely that. They are not fast, and the U.S. probably has sufficient resources to defend against them. Third, the U.S. could probably take a nuclear strike in an event that North Korea tries to strike because we could shoot down a sufficient number of missiles that it wouldn't cause any escalation beyond it. The CISA point is that it would take hours for North Korea to set up its nuclear missiles because their nuclear missile systems are really, really bad, meaning that U.S. like preemptive strikes could probably resolve any North Korea launch. The second argument is that the U.S.-South Korea relationship is tense right now. The ASA point is that Trump has been uniquely aggressive towards North Korea, unlike the Obama administration where Obama tried to decrease sanctions. Trump has recently increased them. The visa point is that Trump literally said they can't do anything without us, indicating that he wants control over South Korean politics policy and that he wants South Korea in line with the United States, um, in line with the United States as it like moves towards uh, as it moves towards sanctioning North Korea. The third argument is that the military of South Korea, or rather the South Korea relies on the United States military. The ASA point is that the U.S. has 24,000 soldiers in South Korea and along the DMZ. The FISA point is that they have PAC-3 MSE uh, missile defense systems and bad systems, which are particularly key because Seoul, which is a city of 24 million people, is right next to the border with North Korea, which indicates that missile defense systems are key to preventing North Korea from literally like shooting rockets over the border. The link arguments is that the uh, decreasing South Korea ending its sanctions collapses U.S. sanctions and angers Trump. Two Chinese shipping companies were recently attacked um, Two Chinese shipping companies recently attacked by the United States for violating these sanctions. But inevitably, when South Korea decreases its sanctions, that means that North Korea can move any of its and all of its trade through South Korea, which makes it impossible for the United States to enforce any of its sanctions because inevitably that South Korea trade can go into China and make the United States sanctions pretty much irrelevant against uh, against North Korea. In term links, the one argument is that this angers the United States, which causes more aggression in places like the DMZ, i.e. the United States tries to build up its military force against North Korea, which makes North Korea particularly more aggressive and defensive in the international sphere. Second, this causes China to be more aggressive uh, try to cause China to be more aggressive because they, they see United States military forces uh, building up in South Korea, which is literally right next to China. They are more likely to build up their military forces in places like the South China Sea. The third argument is that China will resort to other means because the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is like a parallel political order, i.e. there's not a distinction between their military and economic policy because it's all controlled by the top of the CCP. It makes it easy and uniquely able, Chinese uniquely able to transform military policy options into economic policy options. 
the impact is warded due to phospholipids from the uh, from the other sheets, increasingly likely in a case where North Korea is more likely to go war and China's meaning best. The second is that North Korea is likely to be preemptive, preemptively strike. Look to the fact that they said that if Japan were to, or South Korea were to bolster its military forces, they would look more towards nuclear weapons. They would be able to overwhelm the U.S. system, which makes war uniquely bad. And third, China is likely to bolster its strength or bolster its aggressiveness in the trade war because they can transform this to an economic conflict. Next up is the counter plan. South Korea should enforce its sanctions. South Korea should enforce its sanctions. Solvency. This just gets us unique as for our arguments. They can't get out of this around by saying that uh, by saying that these sanctions aren't ever being enforced. So the affirmative is just a symbolic act because in a world of the negative, we are now actually enforcing the sanctions, meaning that we are reassuring the United States that these sanctions exist. Let's go to the first advantage. This describes the ties but does not have an impact. The first argument is that there is not a specific link between these ties and the benefits they say that they get, i.e. a trade deficit is not necessarily a bad thing. They say that it has a negative impact, but this would all be exacerbated in a world where the United States is still trying to sanction, but to, uh, North Korea can export things like to South Korea. The symbolic advantage doesn't matter anymore because we counterplanned out of it, meaning that you obviously can't permit, which means that the sanctions are no longer symbolic, they're being enforced. The third is the culture of unification arguments. First, a couple of things. Uh, a couple of arguments. First, military tensions obviously outweigh this. The fact that the DMZ is the most militarized border in the world indicates that this is completely irresolvable. And second, there's no impact to cultural unification projects. We think war and trade wars are worse. So there was a lot of information just thrown out in that last speech. So to begin, let's go over some of the points brought forward to you in reputation to our own case. But before we do that, let's go over the counter plan and the few advantages that the negation brings forward to you today. Okay, so their counter plan is pretty self-explanatory. They basically say we can't permit, but saying that South Korea should enforce its sanctions. And the main benefit of this is basically reassuring the United States that we're an ally with them. Now, this entire point is going to kind of be talked about when we talk more about reputation. However, what we can see is that this counter plan doesn't necessarily have any unique benefits that they can claim. The one main benefit that they really claim is the idea of reassuring the U.S. And this is going to tie back into when we discuss what the actual point of having the U.S.-South Korean relations are. So what we really see is that the only real positive matter, the only real benefit of the negation side that they bring forward to as of late is just the idea of reassuring the U.S. and basically reassuring, and basically, um, reassuring countries that they're currently in trade with. And so with that being said, let's kind of consolidate some of the information that was brought forward to you by the negation and really boil it down to what they're saying. Okay, so the negation comes up here and in response to a majority of their, our plan, to a majority of our plan, excuse me, they basically say that we're gonna be that we're gonna be irritating three main countries that have an important stake in this in this um, conflict. Those are Japan, China, and the US. So a majority of the information and the threats of war and the impacts of nuclear missiles and ICBMs kind of goes underneath these three main ideas. So let's go through them one by one and see why either in the status quo we're already seeing many of these issues and we're not necessarily seeing a benefit on the negation side. Let's start with the United States. Okay, let's take one little let's let's take a look at the Trump policy and the fact that his maximum pressure policy has been proven to fail. According to CNN, CNN has reported that Pyongyang has continued to expand missile defense systems besides Trump policy. So when we look forward at United States relations, at, when we look at how United Nations, the United Nations, the United States is currently sanctioning North Korea, we can see that these sanctions aren't necessarily leading to denuclearization. So what we can see is that we're already seeing an inherent kind of issue with the way that United States policy is oriented towards North Korea. Here is why necessarily the alliance of South Korea and North Korea doesn't necessarily even though while it isn't necessarily standing on a united front with the United with the United States. We're not seeing the benefit of denuclearization in the status quo. So when we look at South Korea, what are the unique benefits that South Korea gets? We talk about what happens when we lift ban when we lift the ban on North Korean ships from South Korean territorial waters and suspending inter-Korean in trade and banning more cultural exchanges. What we're focusing on here are what are the benefits to South Korea and does this outweigh the negative impacts? When we view is that when we when we don't align ourselves with the United States, we don't believe that that's inherently bad because we're seeing an inherent failure in United States policies. 
we hear some stuff about um, possible ICBMs and the United States being bombed. However, I don't necessarily see a link as to why we should be talking about nuclear warfare because we're not lifting any nuclear sanctions whatsoever. Like I said, like my partner said, is that we will be lifting the the three main sanctions which are placed by South Korea in regards to the United Nations Sanctions Committee. Like that's like kind of the scope that we're arguing under today. So when we look at the United States and the idea of basically about how United States and South Korean tensions are strained right now, the United States has, Trump has come out and said that he is fallen in love with North Korea and fallen in love with Kim Jong-un. Like these are like basically what we can see is that the United States policies towards North Korea aren't necessarily clear in of itself. So why are we expecting South Korea to align itself with the United States when we're seeing a failure of United States policy towards North Korea and we're seeing a failure of an actual consistent basis on policy towards North Korea? Okay, their other point is the idea of China and basically how if we're, uh, basically how this will result in China kind of checking back on the power in Japan, and I'll talk about in Japan in a second. However, we're already seeing a pretty strong basis for North Korean and Chinese relations in, in the status quo, right? Like, we've, we've brought forward the idea that there's a $1.7 billion trade deficit. They bring, forward the, they bring forward the idea of, like, why does the trade deficit matter? We're basically saying that this kind of shows that North Korea and China are up to, I don't want to say up to something, obviously, but if they have a $1.7 billion trade deficit, this is a signal that this is a signal that North Korean and Chinese relations are currently strong. Okay, what are the negative impacts of that? We bring forward the idea of what happens when we have Chinese relations in North Korea, which we believe is inherently bad. We don't want, we don't like the idea of North Korea as a potential superpower being able to back of uh, uh, China as a potential superpower being able to bag North Korea. We don't approve of these relations, and currently that's what we're seeing in the status quo. So they bring forward the idea of um, about increasing Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. Okay, China's already pretty aggressive in the South China Sea. Like if you look at the 20s, if you look at the fact that they undermined the 2016 referendum or whatever for the for um, the Philippines international claim over the water, like that's kind of a nonsensical point because we're seeing it on both sides of today's debate. Like China's already pretty aggressive in the South China Sea. And then, um, and so when we look at China and we look at the fact that they're already current partners, we have to, we have to acknowledge the fact that by South Korea, not only that by South Korea lifting their sanctions, it's improving South Korea and not necessarily changing, not necessarily um, benefiting Chinese relations. They say that you can possibly lead to, um, that trade from North Korea can lead into China. However, we're already seeing trade with China in the status quo. We're simply saying that they should be allowed to trade with South Korea because it has inherent benefits. And that's really what we bring forward to you on the affirmation. We bring forward to you the idea that these sanctions are simply ineffective in the status quo. We bring forward to you the idea that South Korea currently does want to negotiate and does want to actually have better relationships with North Korea. To expand on that, let's look at President Moon, um, Moon Jong, who has worked to improve North-South relations. He's met, he's met, he's met with Kim Jong and he's approved humanitarian aid disbursements. He's um, opened a joint liaison office for looking into an inter-Korean trail. Like he's approved humanitarian aid. We see that we are trying to move forward towards away from the stifling of tensions, right? Like when you look at North and South Korea, obviously they're not necessarily getting along very well. However, how is this how does this how is this solved in the negation world? So a lot of the impacts that they bring forward to you, the idea that military tensions are unsolvable, okay. We all know that things are pretty tense right now. However, when you look at the negation's counter plan, the idea that the South Korea should enforce sanctions because its relationships are more important than its own economy, we reject that. We feel we view South Korean and U.S. relations already confusing at best because South because the United States has such a contradictory policy towards North Korea. We view China as already ha already being a military aggressor in the South China Sea, and the fact that they already are they already are backing North Korea, and we view and we view Japan. Um, uh, okay, so about the idea of Japan turning against South Korea, however, we can't necessarily claim that Japan is suddenly going to have a military threat when Japan doesn't even necessarily have a standing army right now, right? Like, because of Article 9, Japan doesn't even have the military power to actually lead to a full-scale war just because the ocean is open and people and you can have a war in the ocean. Like, we don't claim the idea that we're going to have the impact of war. What's actually going to happen? We're going to actually see the benefit of North and South Korean relations. We're going to see the interchange of, uh, we're going to see cultural exchange. We're going to see um, inter-Korean trade. We're going to see the rise of South Korea as a trade partner, the benefits for both of their economies. We're going to see taking away power from China as a possible superpower and its ability to rise. And frankly, many of the impacts that they bring forward to you are slippery slope arguments at best.
They don't prove to you in any way whatsoever how you can link the impact of war just because we're going to be making some countries angry. When we look at the relations between Japan, China, and U.S., we on the affirmation firmly believe that South Korea, as the actor in today's debate, should prioritize its own economy, should prioritize the proliferation of the proliferation of um, relations moving forward. And that's why I asked for an AF vote. Thank you. Are you going to talk about app framework at all, or just the contention ones? Just the contentions. Okay. Um, ready? Yes. Game over when you're conceding the bulk of the pro with disadvantage. Let's go into the nitty gritty. Sir, I'm meaning this. The first argument that you're conceding is that uh, is that the first argument that you're conceding is that United States and South Korea, uh, South Korean relationships are tense right now. That Trump has literally said that South Korea is incapable of doing anything absent the United States. All of your analysis is specific to Japan and South Korea, but you've not grappled with the fact that our second disadvantage is specifically about the United States and South Korea relationships. You've conceded the link argument, which says that your uh, that, that your class that that. This plan specifically collapses relationships between the you know, between the United States and South Korea and angers Trump specifically because the because specifically because the United States isn't going to be able to enforce any of their sanctions anymore because uh, because you know, because North Korea is always going to be able to circumvent them by moving toward through South Korea, which in which necessarily means that the United States is no longer able to enforce military pressure or uh, no longer to, uh, able to enforce economic pressure on uh, North Korea, which means that they're going to obviously have to turn towards military pressure, which is the ramping up scenario, which is in the internal links. Yes. How do you circumvent? a United Nations nuclear nuclear sanction by trading with South Korea? I don't get your question. Okay, like how can you circumvent a nuclear sanction just by trading with South Korea? Because you said that sanctions aren't going to work. We're, 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 not nuclear, we're not talking about nuclear sanctions. We're talking about economic. I don't get this question. We're just saying that the affirmative plan mm -hmm. just annihilates mm -hmm. relationships between South Korea and the United States because the United States has economic sanctions on North Korea as well. They're, like the sanctions that are on North Korea are not simply nuclear sanctions. They have economic under the UNSC framework that are being undermined when North Korea is able to trade through South Korea, which causes the collapse in relations. I think this is pretty clear. They don't do any work on our impacts, which means that you're always, uh, which means that you can flow through on your sheet that there's going to be conventional war between North, uh, between, uh, between uh, conventional war in the South China Sea, which is the propensity to escalate be, uh, specifically because of first strike capabilities in the region, which leads to a regional conflict, which has the propensity to uh, like spill over into hundreds of thousands of lives in the region as multiple like powers get drawn in, such as like United, uh, United States, South Korea, China, etc., etc. And a value of magnitude first it gives an explicit a value of magnitude for a, a value of magnitude first over probability gives an explicit bright line. I.e., you don't. I.e., you can't. I.e., probability attacks like an arbitrary number onto things. Whereas we have a specific body count th uh, through magnitude framing. And two is that probability cuts both ways. And three is that conce uh, conceded arguments are should be evaluated as one hundred percent true in the debate space. And they've conceded the bulk of our proliferation to side, which means that even if you don't believe any of our link scenarios, they've conceded them, which means you evaluate them with one hundred percent probability. Let's move on to allied assurance. <clears throat> this is where they do all of their work. But we'll still win here. They say that um, they say that North Korea has still expanded their nuclear capabilities despite Trump. That's not our argument. Our argument is that uh, that's not our argument. The, our argument is specifically between relation uh, specifically relationships between South Korea and Japan. But I'll still answer this argument. We think that is that is uniquely worse for the United States to act unilaterally against North Korea rather than uh, rather than multilaterally with uh, with, with South. Uh, with, it's worse for the United States to act alone against North Korea than it is for North Korea for than it is for South Korea and the United States to work together to work together against North Korea, and we also think that the United States is always going to inevitably pursue an aggressive military uh, aggressive policy against North Korea. We think that this is evidenced by like literally like your America First policy and other like like anti nuke rhetoric and sanctions that they have on North Korea. 
They say that Trump has fallen in love with Kim. I really don't know what this argument means, but we still have sanctions in the USC frameworks that are placed under, like, on North Korea right now in the status quo, which probably means that actions are speaking louder than words in this case, which means I don't really get this argument. On the links, they didn't really grapple with any of our links, which means you're extending across that, that the plan literally signals to Japan that South Korea is no longer going to be committed to, ch to challenging North Korea and no longer committed to South Korea as a ally against North Korea, which is really the only point of, like, uh, cohesiveness between the two countries, the two, like we've specifically isolated that the two countries have a lot of tension specifically in the economic sector, but are unified through, through their military coordinate, or through, the, through military efforts, i.e. They're, they're like, they both agree that like North Korea having nukes and having these kinds of like weapons and trade is probably bad, which means that when, uh, which when, when the plan happens and North Korea is, and South Korea is now like no longer having these sanctions on North Korea, Japan freaks out because they don't have, because they're not assured anymore. They say, uh, they say that Article 9 means that Japan doesn't have a military force, but this is just factually false. They have a self-defense force that they're able to mobilize and use against things. They say that, uh, which means that they're not really engaging with any of our internal links, where we specifically tell you that Japan has locked fire control radars onto South Korean ships in order to try to push them out of the sea in the first place. We'd say that in a world where they don't have this kind of uh, military, like, uh, the military incentive to not go to war with each other, this increases the propensity for miscalculation, increases the propensity that Japan is actually going to fire on South Korea and cause war in the first place. That's another place where you could that's another like um like like war scenario that you can vote on they say that china's uh, like china has like already like engaged in the region and undermined like the philippines and whatnot but this is a scalar like scenario you can still get worse like china can still increase their amount of like aggression in the region we'd say that like we'd say that war has not broken out yet but there's still a propensity to break out with more war if you know if china was to go into the region even harder okay on the counter plan uh, their only answer to the counterplan is that there's no unique benefits of the counterplan, but the purpose of the counterplan is to solve advantage two, which means that they're conceding the counterplan, there's no perm or like any analysis, I don't really know. They they don't, can't go for like advantage two because we solve it with the counterplan. It's conceded. Overview to the overview to the advantage work is that sanctions fail because they're not enforced in the status quo. That's the solvency that we're leveraging from our counter plan. I.e. all of their like they don't they don't get to leverage any of their impacts about how like why sanctions are bad or why or about why sanctions are ineffective, etc., etc., because they literally read uniqueness for, against themselves, which says that sanctions are not enforced in the status quo. Moreover, they don't uh, they don't really read any link arguments, etc., on the first advantage when they talk about how like there's a trade deficit, but trade deficit does not necessarily like my partner is isolated. A trade deficit does not necessarily mean that something is bad. The only backfield analytic here is that it just a trade deficit simply proves that something fishy is going on between North Korea and China. But this is not this is not a warrant. This is not a link. This doesn't mean anything to us. And they've not isolated any impact in today's round, i.e., why these sanctions are key to jobs in the region or why it'd be key to saving lives or anything, which means that you're always evaluating the mag high magnitude impacts or the percent chance of war, which is a hundred percent which is conceded, which means that there's a hundred percent of chance that you're going to evaluate war above the like any risk of relations dis like any risk of like a relations advantage, which means that you immediately pull the trigger for the negative there. But even if you grant them like credence on any of their relations arguments and that somehow relationships are going to improve, we'd say that war simply outweighs because loss of life should always come before whatever diplomatic arrangements they have not isolated in any of their speeches. Also, don't let them back the list in the PMR because we, there's no there's no impact on the sheet that you can evaluate coming out of the 1AAC or 2AC, which means that we're not able to respond if they read a new one in the 1AR, which means that you should just not evaluate any new impacts in the 1AR. Make them work with what they have on the table right now, and they don't have anything. Okay. And then finally, on the advantage about improved relationships, the, they've conceded my partner's analysis about how mili military tensions probably outweighs this, and also there's no impact to cultural unification. They've not isolated why your cultural unification spills over to diplomatic and, uh, uh, diplomatic unification or economic unification or anything else. I don't know why like cultural uh, unification is important, and again, don't let them collapse on this bastardization of an argument in the final speech. Should I flow the overview?
sanctions are good. They reassure allies and stave off adversary aggressiveness. The first issue that's a little bit sketchy is the counterplan, so I just want to clarify. They can't go for the argument that sanctions are ineffective or that South Korea and North Korea have some buddy-buddy relationship. Because in a world where you vote negative, that's all resolved. We both resolve independently this impact, i.e. somehow they make relationships better and they access some impact, which we'll get to later. But in the world of the negative, South Korea starts enforcing its sanctions, which is the problem they isolate is the reason why all of this trade deficit stuff exists, which means that South Korea is bolstering its commitment to United States policy. Now let's go to the first layer, which is broadly. United States policy should control your evaluation of the ground. Trump is inevitably going to be aggressive. He's not going to all of a sudden decide to switch his military policy from being aggressive towards North Korea just because South Korea decides to stop enforcing sanctions. That's really, really bad because it causes the United States to do things like increase military investments when it can no longer use economic policy like sanctions because instead of selling stuff to China, North Korea can now sell stuff to South Korea, which can sell it to China, which means North Korean products can access the broader market. That means that the U.S. is inevitably forced to military to militarize, which is really problematic. They say that we don't even need this for a lot of, our, we don't even need this for like the North Korea scenario. They've confused the fact that we, there's a difference between North Korea having nuclear weapons and not having nuclear weapons and having enough to overwhelm U.S. nuclear missile defense systems. What we say is that North Korea does not have enough to do that right now, which means that we are relatively secure right now. In a world where we increase military aggressiveness against North Korea, that's bad, and that's the world of the app. So when they come up and say we want to thaw relations, realize that they are not doing that because Trump will get more aggressive. That The impact of that is like on multiple sheets, and so I'll clarify right now. The China arguments are really key. They've confused China becoming aggressive in different domains. Specifically, we say that Japan would get angry because they've already had bad tensions, or rather, they already have high tensions with South Korea. And they would get angry when Japan, when South Korea isolates them on their key issue. That means that when Japan and South Korea starts fighting, this is prime time for China to come in and become more aggressive. When the United States starts losing allies against its worst enemies in the region, it is obviously a huge incentive for its biggest adversary to increase military commitments. And since China can, with parallel structure, move those into economic commitments, that means that what happens when you vote affirmative is you collapse this U.S. structure. You make the U.S. appear weak, which encourages China to become more aggressive in pretty much every battle conflict. Even if they say that it's not unique because of South China Sea, they've conceded the argument that South Korea and South Korea and Japan are fighting in a different domain over different territorial disputes, which is a unique thing that has not happened yet. A split between U.S. regional allies, which indicates that China would exploit that because they know that it's in their best interest to do that. We don't even need to go for war impacts, but we'll still go for them. You, they've conceded this magnitude, or they've, they're, like, they're behind the magnitude framing, but even if they win, they should evaluate probable impacts. They're winning a low probability of case, which means it probably cuts both ways. When they concede arguments, you have to evaluate them as 100% true. Otherwise, you are intervening and deciding the probability of arguments based on research that hopefully you haven't done during prep time, because that would be an intervention. Go to, I'll do the war scenarios now. Look, these islands are impossible to control, which means the escalation is pretty much inevitable. Because once one bad one thing goes wrong, it's not like you can easily send in a bunch of troops and just secure it because it's in the middle of open water. That means that there's a high risk for things like sub bumping and aerial assaults going wrong because we can't just like control it by surrounding it like a fort and just solving the problem and winning the war right away. That's never going to happen. You need to get access to these armies. Even if we don't, we get access to the trade war arguments that China becomes increasingly aggressive, which probably turns all of their arguments because, you know, the economy. Now let's go to their arguments. They have not isolated the impact, so you should be very, very wary of voting affirmative because you should be weighing an impact that was in a previous speech that we could refute it against the impact of war or trade war. But even if you do, their best argument is this trade deficit argument, but they can't go for it because we solve that trade deficit when we start enforcing sanctions. The symbolic argument was refuted. The only thing that they have left is cultural unification. This argument is turned by the fact that when the U.S. increases its military presence on the DMZ, this is probably not going to lead to a lot of cultural unification between South Korea and Japan because the U.S. will be very angry. 
debate today, we have seen an impressive amount of information brought on both sides regarding the relationship between South Korea and its sanctions on North Korea. And so in my final speech, I'm just going to be kind of going over what we've seen in the round today, presenting some key issues that have occurred between the affirmation and negation cases, and showing how on each one of these issues, the affirmation comes out as the victor of the debate today. So just to recap a little bit, the affirmation brought you the arguments that um, because of the relationships between China and North Korea, because of the ineffectiveness of sanctions in North Korea, and because of the benefits of improved relationships with North Korea, these are the three main ideas, it is beneficial under the way mechanism of net benefits to uh, alleviate sanctions on trade within the boundaries of the United Nations sanctions. And we are focusing on the ability of North Korea to trade uh, with South Korea and to use their waterways and additionally cultural exchanges between the two nations. Um, and so we provide, we have essentially presented that as our plan. Um, the, the, the negation is countered with a lot of different impacts, the most drastic of which being um, an international war. And, but the problem is that we're not seeing the way that a lot of these cases link together. So let me just clarify some of that. So the first question that I have at the end of this debate is what was the purpose of the sanctions on South Korea and what are the impacts of these sanctions? So the affirmation presented that the sanctions on North Korea derived from a conflict that occurred in 2010. And the sanctions have resulted in a closer economic and military tie between North Korea and China. And so this uh, greater economic and political support for North Korea by China um, is resulting in greater uh, kind of clouded waters of trade deals, which never is good for international communication, and additionally a greater support of China for North Korean nuclearization in violation of United Nations sanctions. And this is an inherent negative benefit of the uh, trade sanctions. And secondly, we, the, the sanctions aren't serving the purpose that they're meant to. If sanctions aren't uni being uni universally enforced because they simply aren't practical, um, the benefit provided you by the nation's counter plan fails. Because if sanctions aren't practical in the first place and therefore aren't being enforced, the benefits won't be seen by enforcing an impractical plan. This brings me to my second voter reason, which is analysis of what's actually going to be the impact of um, South Korea's decision to alleviate its sanctions on North Korea. So the negation has made the startling claim that by lifting sanctions on North Korea, there will eventually be war involving nations such as China, the United States, Japan, and South Korea. They're essentially claiming that because we are angering various nations, it's allowing China to assert a position of dominance and to ultimately act in aggression. However, they don't necessarily show that China merely getting a little bit upset about something will lead to war. We haven't seen this precedent in the past that an irritation in this zone in an area of trade has led to all-out war, especially in recent times, and we can't claim this impact. This is the most uh, large-scale impact of their, of their case today, and so we can't claim that whatsoever because of just the lack of proof that war is going to happen because um, of this decision merely involving trade sanctions and um, cultural intervention, then we can't claim these impacts. Additionally, they make the assertions that um, because the sanctions aren't working, that all sanctions are going to be rendered null and void if these are removed. However, we can't generalize that by removing one sanction that the rest of them are all going to be declared um, ineffective simply because if you look within the plan, we are acting within United Nations sanctions. They do make the point um, that by um, that they we're supposedly violating United Nations claims. However, these South Korean sanctions are independent and there's no United Nations claims that are necessarily um, enacting the things that they are doing, so this impact falls. And then additionally, they present the idea that the United States relationship is essential and the failure of that uh, would result in the failure of South Korean um, stability and politics. However, as my partner has stated, when the United States is releasing contradictory contradictory statements in regards to its relationship with North Korea, where we're seeing different statements being released from various conferences, it's impractical and not right for and unreasonable to expect South Korea to unilaterally stand by the contradictory United States position at the expense of their own communications with other nations and even at the expense of their own economy. So this brings us to the benefits brought to you by the affirmation case. We can always see that improved relations between tense nations um, bring benefit on a large scale. So we're seeing that with greater trade between South Korea, we're observing economic improvement, greater opportunity for diplomatic relations, and ultimately the global impact of North Korea being less attached to China, which affects both economic and nuclear fronts. And so for all of these reasons, we ask for an affirmation vote. Thank you.
Jim Shaw to uh, to what? <laughs> to say power to the Earth. I don't know if the RFD will really be important, but I don't right know if you want to answer. Yeah. Go to the back. My RFD is very important. <laughs> <laughs>